It's wonderful being here again. I think this is our third or fourth time now at Cheers. And just as a little bit more introduction for those that don't know, don't know us yet, um, we came to faith late in life. Um, and we were only believers for about five years when having no idea at all that we'd ever be called to the mission field, God suddenly called us. At this point, we hadn't done a short-term mission. We hadn't done anything. And then suddenly feeling God calling us to long-term missions. But it was worse than that. It, was, um, it wasn't just being called to long-term missions. As Marilla was saying, it was being called to a place that we knew would be the complete opposite of a place that we would choose in the flesh. It was a country that would drive us mad in so many ways because it was complete opposite of anything we would choose. We get 54 Celsius sometimes in India, and as Marilla says, I'm a cold-weather person. Um, Jenny was a germaphobe, and this is a, a place that if, if you look at the spectrum of countries on the earth, India is probably number one in terms of filth and garbage and things that are going to press the buttons of a germaphobe. But that's how we look at it from human eyes. From God's eyes, it is absolutely the perfect place. It's the crucible where he breaks you down and gets you to that place where you realize just exactly how much you need him. And the blessing that has come through that is something that has shocked us, amazed us, blessed us in ways we couldn't even imagine. Uh, we, often, we often talk about our journey as being one in paradox because there's so many things about where we are that on the one pole are absolutely awful. I wouldn't wish them on our worst enemy. And on the opposite side of it, at the same time, God is blessing what is happening in this land in ways that are unimaginable. So it's kind of like that, that saying where they say it's the best of times, it's the worst of times, but both are true at the same time. And this is kind of our, the reality that we live in within India. It's a place where um, it's, it's like the Old Testament, only they have modern vehicles. Um, in terms of their thinking, in terms of their culture, this is a place that Satan has held since the beginning of time. This is a country that has never been held by Christians. So it's not an unusual experience at all for us when we go out on a prayer walk and we come to a street and the Holy Spirit just speaks to us and we know that there has never been a Christian on this spot on earth ever before. <laughs> There's never been light here ever before. <laughs> And what an honor that comes with that, to be the first one to pray. But God had to get us there. It took, we prayed for seven different confirmation signs before we even went. And we figured we were going to be off the hook. Seven signs, what's the odds of all these coming true? God gave all seven to us in the same day. He, he had to make it so clear because this is one of those places that is so hard to stay that the only thing that you hold on to at times is knowing that God wants you there because it seems like everything is against you. And it would be just so easy to walk away from that and come back. But God sent us and are really at the end of the day, it's will we be obedient no matter how awful it gets or will we turn back on God and we'll say, no, God, it's too much. And what would happen if God did that to us if he said it was too much instead of saving us? Now, Cheers has had a, a great role in our ministry from the beginning. We've, this is the place that we go to online to actually watch service, um, and it's a difficult place. There's always a chance, even in watching service when we're in India, that the government's going to pick it up, that we're going to get arrested, that we're going to get kicked out of the country. We could have that happen to us by getting an email that has to open up language. So there's a lot of risks with, with where we're actually at. And yet, Cheers has been a place that we connect with regularly. We know that people have been praying for us. We've had some profound prophecies prayed over us uh, from this church, all of which have come true. It's just been such a blessing to us through, the, through this church. And so, yeah, we, we just love this place. And, and this church is supporting us financially as well, so deeply rooted in our ministries. And so what I want to share today, I want to share a little bit about 
what it's like there in the context in which people are trying to come to faith within this country. And then I want to give glory to God for what he has done. Because what he has done in the last less than two years is shocking even to us of what he's accomplished in so short of time. It is, it's been so profound that in many ways it feels like when we got there, God was waiting for somebody to show up. He was waiting for people to pray. He had heard the cries of these people in the slums where we minister for far too long. And it was the second we got to the slums, it was like God saying, okay, now we're going. And it was like a struggle to keep up with them. So much was happening so fast. And yet this is pioneer ground. This is a place that nobody had ever ministered before at the same time. So we want to give God, glory to God for that. But before we get into that, I want to start us off with scripture, if we can get that up. And this, I'm titling this service, Faith Within the Fire, because this is really the context in which believers um, are living out their lives within India. So we're going to start with Daniel 3, 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, this verse speaks to me so tangibly because this is the reality for believers in India. It's one where, if you can imagine the terror of these men facing the situation. You know, today, many people, even in the church, will go, well, they were just being asked to compromise their faith. You know, if they bowed down before this thing, they could repent. God would forgive them. And I think that's a really sad thing that anybody would think down those lines because what these men were being asked to do, they were being asked to renounce their faith. They were being asked to place God second at best. And this was something that every fiber in their being cried out against. And yet they knew, it's very clear in this verse, they didn't know if God was going to save them. They are facing one of the most agonizing deaths imaginable, being thrown into a fire. My background is paramedic, as a volunteer firefighter. I know how awful that would be and how painful, excruciating that would be. And yet they're saying to him, we know our God is capable of saving us. And if it's his will, he will save us. But even if he doesn't, we won't bow down before that idol. But even if he doesn't, we will not serve your gods. They knew God was capable of saving them, but they didn't, had no idea whether God was going to come through and save them in the circumstance. Brutal, brutal decision. And yet this is the reality being faced by many Christians in the world. I would dare say the majority of Christians in the world, especially in the countries where the faith is growing strongest and growing fastest. And there's something here that's mixed in between the state of persecution upon believers and what they're facing and the strength of the church. They seem to go together. The hotter it gets, the stronger the church becomes. It's almost illogical when you think about it, but it's how God is working. It's an amazing thing. And the reason I say this is that in India, to make a faith decision for Christ could immediately cost you your life. At the very best, it will result in you being banished. So you've set immediately by making a declaration of a faith as one person, you'll be banished from your family. You no longer exist. You are kicked out of your home. You'll probably be beaten on the way. This is the best case scenario. You've lost your job, every contact. Uh, they may take your wife away from you. It, the children may or may not go with you. It depends on the family but you no longer exist in a society where everything is done communally. Every connection, every opportunity is based upon who you know. Suddenly, you know no one. And for most of these people, that means that they're going to be living in slum-like conditions because they have nothing. Literally, in making that decision for Christ, it is going to cost them everything of this world. So they need to be very careful in making that decision ahead of time of having weighed all that out, weighing the cost, and at the end of it, when somebody declares themselves for Christ, you know what it has cost them. There's missionaries that have talked about 
that have done great damage in many ways because, as I said, this could, that's the best case scenario. It could easily cost you your life because it's a shame thing for the family in making a declaration of faith. If they're not believers in Christ, to them, all decisions are made communally. They're never made at an individual level. So by them coming to faith and not discussing it with their family and not bringing it out to the wider extended network, even their whole community, this is a very shameful thing in their culture. That's not how decisions are made. And that has implications for how we have to witness to people as well. We have to witness to groups, not individuals, because that's not how they make their decisions. But it's a very dangerous thing to make that decision because it could cost you your life immediately. And this is what people are facing. So every believer that comes to faith in India has to, number one, have weighed out the cost ahead of time and be comfortable with this, that no matter what, my faith in Christ is so important, I am willing to lay down my life right now by saying it. That's what they have to go into and be confident that that's the situation. And they know that it's, it could potentially cost them their life and they have to be in that place of comfort knowing that if they die immediately after their declaration of faith, if a mob comes and hacks them down with machetes, if they're beaten to death, stoned, whatever, that trusting that God will have purpose in their death even if they don't know what that purpose is. Now that's a depth of faith that's hard to imagine here and that's what they face on a regular basis in India. We've come across pastors in India whose stories and believers just in the congregations whose stories are the pain they've gone through is unimaginable. The force that's been exerted towards them to try to get them to renounce their faith after coming to faith or to stop witnessing to others is staggering. We've talked to pastors who've spent more years of their life in jail because of their faith than they have in freedom. We've talked to the believers who have had their entire families hacked down one by one in front of their eyes while they're trying to get them to renounce their faith and to stand on that while you watch your family members die. It's not an uncommon thing for them to use rape, raping somebody's wife in front of them in trying to get them to renounce their faith. This is the type of pressure that the church is under. And yet within this, what God does is staggering. The strength of faith within these and the commitment to further the kingdom is staggering because these people know what it's already cost. They know that Christ is worth it and there's nothing that's going to turn them back. They know the rewards are not of this earth and not of this world. The rewards will come in heaven and if it costs them laying down their lives now, it's worth it because somebody else will come to faith as a result of that sacrifice. Often our reaction to persecution here is our immediate things is we want to get rid of it. We want to Save those people that are being persecuted. We want it to end. We want the persecutors to be punished. All of these things. That's not what the people there are asking for. Because the only way for that persecution to end would be for them to stop witnessing for Christ. The two go hand in hand. As people witness boldly, persecution increases as people respond to the gospel. That's why in countries where the gospel is growing and the kingdom is growing fastest and deepest and just staggering things are happening, this, this is the exact correlation. It's because they're facing that kind of heat. They get that depth of faith that can't perhaps happen in any other way. The two go hand in hand together. And through that, the church grows in staggering ways. What they are asking for is not relief from the persecution. What their prayers are are for them to remain, to have the strength to be obedient no matter what they face. When somebody may be killed, when horrific circumstances may happen, when people barge into their church and attack the congregation, they want the strength and ask for prayers for strength to stay obedient to God no matter what happens to them. Their fear is that through that pressure, it may be so much that they would renounce their faith. They are in this crucible all the time. So their prayers are not for relief from persecution because it, the only way to relieve that would be to stop witnessing for Christ. And that is not at all what is in their heart. They want to glorify Christ no matter what it costs them. 
Their prayer is for them to have the strength to remain obedient and for their persecutors to become their brothers and sisters in faith. They're not praying for them to be punished. They're not praying for it to stop. They're praying for these people to come to faith and join them and see them in heaven someday. That's what's happening in India. In strong, strong contrast to this, in first world, we see so many people that are reluctant to commit to anything without first knowing what the predictable outcome will be and ensuring there's safety involved in it. That's not the course. That's not how the gospel advanced it anywhere in the Bible. This is, this is modern teaching. This is not, has nothing to do with what the Bible is teaching. And yet it's a cultural way of thinking that's creeping into the church. What we need is the strength of these people. The, the kingdom would be advancing in staggering ways if this, if this was the reality for all of us. So we need to get to that place to recognize there is a problem in our willingness to go, in our willingness to sacrifice, in our willingness to serve to the point of laying down our lives if that's what it costs. In the Great Commission, Christ commands us to go. But in nowhere in that does he say that there's a guarantee you're going to come back. If anything, he says again and again through it, that as I was persecuted, you will be persecuted. As I was hated, you will be hated. He promises that the promise that we can hold on to is that he will be there with us through it all to the very end. That's what we can cling to. But nowhere does he, cl does he claim that this is going to be a safe journey, that you're not going to die along the way. These, in the majority of the Christian world and in countries like this, are expectations, they're normative, that suffering is a, can occur as a result of your faith. And there, it's also seen as something that strengthens faith at the same time. So when we think of our culture and other places, we have to ask the question, where are we more free? Are we freer in a place like North America where we have democracy, where we have rights, where we have laws to protect us? And yet few people are willing to knock on their neighbor's door and have a discussion about Christ because they're afraid to share Christ. Or are they more free in a country facing intense persecution, possibly under Sharia law, where knowing that if they talk to the wrong person and are misled in any way, they may be killed today. And yet they're sharing boldly and they're sharing with every person they can because they want them to be saved. Which country are we truly more free or in? Persecutors... Their intent is to get us to stop sharing Christ. They do it through violence. They do it through intimidation. They do it through anything we can to get us to renounce our faith or stop sharing it. it in a place like India, it, and in a place like the majority of the world, China, all of these persecuted countries, it's not working. The church is growing stronger. And yet their intent, well, we're not facing that kind of persecution here, is being accomplished. How many people are sharing Christ in a bold way, on an intentional way, to bring people to Christ on a regular basis? What the persecutors are hoping for over there isn't working. They're not being persecuted here, but that's exactly what's happening. We need to find that place of depth of faith that we're willing to give anything to Christ. Now, in our own journey, I could certainly say that our pattern has not been that God takes us to zero to 100 in 10 seconds. This has been a step-by-step faith-building journey for us. And God has been so faithful on this. In every decision we've had to make, in terms of going, in terms of staying, in terms of ministry and what, we're, what we endure there on a regular basis, has been one step at a time where God has asked us to step through a door having no idea what is on the other side. And he's asked, will you step through this door with me on faith alone, having no idea what's on the other side? Human mind can just play nightmares with the, the what ifs. What if I step through this door? Will I lose it all? Will I die? All of these things are going through your mind, and God is just simply asking, do you trust me? Will you take that one step? And then another step, and another step. Every time we've done that, what's been on the other side of the door has blown our mind. 
It's been staggering what God has done as a result of every step in faith that we've done. For those that have been following, following what's been happening in our ministries in India, you know that our biggest ministry is conducted inside a madrasa. So for those of you who don't know what that is, a madrasa is an Islamic theological school. It's where they teach the tenets of their faith. We have our largest ministries inside their building. We have a whole floor rented out. And when we made the step of God asking us to go through this door with him and step into this madrasa, it was terrifying. Immediately we're going, we're not going to survive one day. It was terrifying walking into the building because you know this is a stronghold of Islam and you would see this as the spiritual opponent. So God, what are you doing? Really, you want me to step in here? And having no idea what he's going to do with this. Walking into the building was terrifying. As we thought our way through this, we go, well, maybe God wants us to pray in this place and help break down the stronghold. And we can do that quietly without getting ourselves killed. Or maybe he'll ask us to do humanitarian work, which will shine some light of Christ. But how are we going to witness for Christ? How are we going to share him in a way that will bring people to faith? And yet when we step through that door with him, what he did has been staggering. We are witnessing openly within their madrasa to large numbers of people in a very concrete, methodical way, week after week with the same people sharing Christ. And what's allowing us to do this is that we aren't doing it the way our culture does it because their culture doesn't think like our culture. In our culture, we make our faith decisions person by person. I talk to you, and, you know, we have some more discussions, and hopefully we, we come to a thing where you, you eventually come to faith. In their culture, you never make big decisions on an individual basis. It's always family, extended family, or an entire community. So what needs to happen is they all need to be talking for quite some time and get a buzz going and keep planting seed after seed after seed and encourage them to talk, encourage them to ask questions among each other until they get to this threshold where instead of one person saying, I believe in Christ, you have an entire family, an entire community, 10,000 today say we've come to Christ. That's what we're after, and that's how you witness in a culture like this. It's so foreign to the way we do things here. And yet, by doing it this way, we're witnessing to large people, it's allowing us to do it openly, even within their stronghold, because of the, we're not doing it in a way they would consider shameful. They love to talk about faith. And so we're just encouraged them every step of the way. Ask your mom about this. We draw in things from the Quran um, even as, and use it as a bridge to get them into the Bible, the things we have in common. The Muslims believe that Christ was born of a virgin, that he led a sinless life, that he raised from the dead, that he did more miracles than any of the prophets. But what they have never thought about, because they don't learn this way, is Why? Of all the prophets, which generally follows some similarities amongst them, and even if, you, even if you want to bring Muhammad into this group, why is Jesus the only one that stood out in these ways? Why is he unique amongst all of them? And we can talk about that inside their stronghold and encourage them to pray on it, encourage them to talk to their neighbors, their husbands, ask their imam. We ask them to ask the teacher at, at this very place. We've had... Um, sermons done talking about the benefit of what we were doing to the community. These people are not Muslims, but you need to model what they are doing because they're actually concerned about us, and this is what you need to be modeling. Spoken from Muslim leaders. This is what God does when you trust him and you take those steps of faith one by one. So what I really want to share and encourage everybody with is never be afraid to walk through a door into the unknown with Christ. If you feel the Spirit asking you to take a step, don't be afraid. Don't worry all of the what ifs. They're human responses. They're going to flood you. There's no matter what. But if you take that step into the unknown with him, he has never failed us. He has blown our minds with what he's done with every step of faith that we've taken him. And the bigger the, bigger the step, the the bigger of the things that he's done. The last time we were here, uh, about a year ago, we were in three different slums um, at the time, and 
we were running a pre and postnatal um, clinic. We were doing some um, sewing training with women to create employment within the slum communities. And we had just done our first medical clinic at another slum. In the past eight months, this has expanded to a fourth slum. Um, the medical component of it has expanded so that we're going to all of the slums on a weekly basis uh, to two different places every week with this. The expansion of reach that we've gone to for people is now up to 500 people that we're seeing on a weekly basis, 10,000 people who two years ago had never heard of Christ are now being exposed to Christ through four slums. Complete pioneer work. When we arrived, there were no allies. There was, we had no resources. It was purely a step-by-step -step of God leading one step at a time and asking you to be obedient and faithful. We've done nothing. We've, every step of this has just been watching God work and the honor of being able to go along with him on this journey. It's been staggering. The most exciting part of it, however, is that he's brought us local partners as well. We now have, while we're here, we have a Christian NGO of 24 people now that are doing all of the ministries in the city where we have just come from. Everything is sustainable under local. So no matter what happens to us, this work will continue and be born, born through until the harvest. God is already, after two years, moving us on to a second city to start doing it again. And what he's going to do there remains to be seen. We're asking, again, to start a new missional business, asking to look for new ministry. So it's all complete new ground. We'll be going to Agra, which is the site of the Taj Mahal, one of the seven wonders of the world. But again, even in a place where there's so much tourism, there is no work being done amongst Muslims. We'll be the first ones there. Again, as we arrived in our first city, no allies, no resources, nobody to help us in this new place other than God leading us step by step, and we're trusting him to do the same thing. So what I want to do now is I want to share a couple of stories and a couple of pictures, and then we'll show you a video to show us, to just give you some sense of the ministries. If I can get that first photo up. So this is in the madrasa. This is opening day at the madrasa, and this is the Qazi. So he's the religious leader of this institution. So he's one rank below an imam. Um, so he's the one that, that teaches all the theology, and then he's got his row of teachers going down the stairs below us, and we're cutting the ribbon there to, get, to open the floor where, we do, where we're doing all of these ministries. Um, again, just a shocking thing, and he's become such an ally of ours um, in the community. He has opened so many doors. And again, it's the spiritual eyes of, you know, we see things one way and go, this is somebody we want to stay away from. This is the biggest threat we could have. And yet God has turned him into an ally, staggering. So we're praying for road to Damascus types of experiences for this guy because we can imagine what he would accomplish in this community. The second picture. This is Kusum, and Kusum actually is Hindu background. She's not, uh, she wasn't uh, Muslim. And she came to work for us at our bedded breakfast. Now, she's a new believer. Um, when she first came to us, she was a believer of only six months. And what she has endured for her faith is the epitome of everything I've just talked about. She came to faith as a result of somebody in her family having mental illness. And they had, the family had gone to everywhere. They were just at loose ends. They had tried doctors. They had tried witch doctors. They had tried spells, charms, everything. And nothing had worked. And so finally, they come to the end of the rope. They go, well, there's, we haven't tried a pastor yet. Let's try one of them. And they came and prayed, and there was a complete change in this, in this family member. This is what led her to faith. Now, Kusum has three children? Three children. And her faith is so profound that it is humbling to watch her pray. This woman, when she made her declaration of faith, was beaten immediately. Her husband called the police and had her arrested for having converted to, to, to Christianity. The police are all, are all Hindu as well. She spent her time in jail with them trying to get her to recant her faith. Day one. Rumors spreading throughout the entire community trying to discredit her, saying she was a loose woman and all of this immediately went to work. To go to church... And she, this is happening even now as we're here. Today is likely happening. She is first beaten by her husband. She will come to work with black eyes. She'll be black and blue. Her children she's been trying to take as well. They are definitely interested in Christ as well because she's sharing with them. 
to leave the community, they will have garbage thrown at them, the community will beat the children, and the same thing's going to happen when they come back in. And this is what she is standing on. She has the strength of faith as a new believer of six months that she's enduring everything imaginable that they could throw at her for her faith. And her prayer, when we ask her what her prayer is, we go, you know, immediately we have that same thing. Go, let's get her away from the husband. Husband's a dangerous guy. And her prayer is not to get her away from her husband. Her prayer is for that community to come to faith, for her husband to come to faith, for them all to be able to worship together. When she prays, she is prays for hours just weeping. The depth, you know, people often say, you know, in places like India, well, their theology is only this deep. And that may be true. They may not have a deep theology. But their relationship and living faith with Christ is miles deep, right from the get-go. This is a place where they expect miracles from day one, where they have the desperation for Christ that he has to be holding their hand to walk out the door with them every day and through every moment because you couldn't possibly survive the journey any other way. This is Kusum. Third one. Now this is, we actually took Kusum to this celebration. This is last Christmas. And we brought together people from families from all four slums. And we did a joint Christmas celebration at one of the slums. We had 400 families attend. All of these are Muslims. During this, their children were singing songs of praise to Christ. They were enacting parables on stage. They brought in one of the best evangelists in the city to proclaim Christ boldly to 400 Muslim families at the same time. Kusum couldn't believe it. She says, to have even Christ declare before one of them is scary enough, but bring 400 together and nothing happened and they're laughing and celebrating and having joy in this event, that's what God is capable of and that's what God does in places like this. He does the unexpected, he does the miraculous. The next picture. Now, this baby actually was on Boxing Day uh, last year, and we were asked to go out to a family where they use the word midwives very loosely there. It's just somebody that delivers babies, but they have no training, and often it's very dangerous. Well, one of the young ladies, she was 16 and having her first baby, so she came up through the schooling program in the slums that is run by our NGO partners there. And just a wonderful woman with a great smile and just happy all the time. They asked her to come out and see her because she had just delivered her baby and she was in great pain. And we found out that they had done, the midwife had done an episiotomy on her. Now, you'll see in a few minutes, they did this in, inside her shelter. Now, shelters are filthy. It's just tarps and sticks. And you, you can't imagine more garbage being around. And this is where you're cutting a person open, not knowing what they're doing, probably not having sanitized anything. And the baby was only like five pounds anyhow. So an episiotomy is kind of a, a, a weird thing to do anyhow. But they asked us to go out and check her. And she was, she was already in, having infection. The baby was jaundiced. Both were at risk. And God just put us in that place where we were able to pray with them. We were able to give medications. Both ended up through this situation um, really well. But again, if God hadn't put us there at that time, likely neither of these would be alive today. Next picture. Now, these ones are uh, kind of a horrific story. The mother here is uh, Tara, they would say there, and the, the babies are Abida and Jashna. Now, these are twins, and when we first encountered these, they were 14 months old. One of them weighed nine and a half pounds. The other was just over 10. At 14 months, they were starving to death. We see... Children all the time, they're severely malnourished. But this is the first time we've seen starvation where they didn't have long to go. So we got we, lots of prayer going down on this. We got food packets, nutritional packets going to supplement them up. And when we came back for, for this time, they were now a year and a half. And they were gaining weight steadily. They're still at the point at a year and a half where they can't walk because they're so weak. But they're starting to bear some weight on their legs which is a huge improvement. These kids were on the brink of death. Next picture. 
Now, this, this one here is actually a, a really interesting story. This woman had come to us as part of our pre- and postnatal program, and she had um, she'd had a, a raging yeast infection for three years. Now, in India, your treatment is sketchy at best, and so she'd been suffering for quite some time. And we had opened things up to the women and we, at one point, and we just said, if you're more comfortable talking about personal things, you can talk to my wife, and she'll relate it, and we'll figure out how to treat you. Well, that has become kind of a landslide for Jenny of all these women going to her after this. And she got in, had to do with some pretty personal things. So we treated her with one pill for her yeast infection, and she was immediately cured after three years of suffering. But the best part, because she had already been with our program for about a year at this point, and we've been praying with these women, and we've been talking about God every week. And she said, but it was not the pill. It was your upper volley that cured me. And she had that instinctive insight. And Upravali means your highest one. So she, this is a Hindu woman as well. She worships all kinds of idols. And she worshiped that our God did something that everything she had tried and all the idols that she had prayed to was never able to accomplish. And she had that instinctive knowledge that this was God curing her. The next one. Now this we call the miracle baby. And this happened just a couple of weeks before we actually came back this summer. And again, this woman come to us as part of our prenatal program, and she brought us an uh, ultrasound report from her doctor, and she was eight and a half months pregnant at the time. And, the, and it was very worrisome. As soon as we read it, it was the doctor wanted to do an immediate emergency C-section on her. Her, um, her placenta was detaching, and she was virtually dry of amniotic fluid. Mother and baby both at severe risk. The scary thing is that she had sat on this for a week before she brought this forward. And the reason she did this is the doctor wanted to have another ultrasound before he would do that surgery. In her mind, she'd go, it doesn't matter because I can't afford an ultrasound and I certainly can't afford the surgery. So I'm just going to wait and trust and see what happens. And so she waited at the risk of her baby's life and her life. So we immediately went into action and we had to get her, first of all, to get that ultrasound, get her over to get that emergency C-section that we were expecting. The first pro words out of her mouth is, but I can't go because my husband will beat me. And in this society, you don't leave the community until you have a male relative with him. He was, um, I think he was maybe about to come back from work for that day, but you don't just spring something on a husband in these societies. You need to plan everything ahead of time. So we sent people with the NGO, from our NGO partner over to talk to him, and they convinced him to let her go to the hospital. They get the ultrasound. This is after a week from the first one. It's even worse. The placenta is almost completely detached. She's dry of amniotic fluid. And she's also, um, she's also anemic. So now they want to run blood before they do the surgery because they figure she won't make it through the surgery. So in India, nothing is easy. You don't just call the blood bank and they bring down some blood for you. You have to find your own friends, have to go and donate their own blood. So you have to have a whole bunch of them go to find somebody that's your own type, donate the blood, and then they'll administer that blood to you is the way it works. So that takes some time. It was about three more days before all of this was done and the blood was administered and they're all ready to go for, for this emergency C-section. So they decide they're going to do one last, because we're paying for it now, so they're not so concerned for the money now. And they do one last ultrasound on her C to, to just confirm everything was good to go for this delivery. When they did that ultrasound, the placenta was completely attached. There was no problem. She was completely full of amniotic fluid again. They didn't do a C-section on her. She delivered two hours later with a healthy baby, naturally. Miracle baby. Gift of God. And this was, I believe that whole intervening period was to give time for prayer to go down. We had people in our network praying on it, both here in Canada and in India. The whole NGO was praying on it. People were with her around the clock, praying with her at the hospital. And that's what God did in response. So what I want to do now is I want to show you a uh, short video, and this will show you all of the ministries and give you some visuals of what it's like in the slums where we minister as well. And the slums have become our happiest place on earth. It's a disgusting place to western eyes to look at, and the smells and the flies and the, what these people have and come there. They're filled with scabies and worms and disease, and they come, and you just love on them, and you treat them. And so many come that have nothing wrong with them as well. And they're just looking for somebody for the first time in their lives to listen to them and have 
value them because they're treated like animals. This is a society where things work by caste system, and these people are on the very, very bottom of that whole thing. We're trying to equip these people to have better lives. In every one of these ministries, though, we use it as a way to share Christ with them. You saw um, one of the women holding up a garment that she was making. This was in our sewing center. So the women are, the first batch of women are now um, just graduating and doing certification exams for a, a credential that they will be able to take anywhere in India as tailors. So we've not only equipped them and provided clothes for those that were naked, but we've also equipped them to earn an income and to make their own clothes for their families and things like this. Um, as one of the examples of ways that we get Christ into all of them, we currently have them working in at Christmas time. We'll be bringing these back, but they're working on a contract of placemats for us. And what we have printed on them is we have John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Because for Muslims, their biggest struggle is that Christ is the only way. That's their barrier. So we have that on here, and we have it printed in English. We have it printed in Arabic, the language of the Quran, and we have it in Hindi script as well, which is the script that they read. And what they're doing after this is the women are embroidering around and making all these flower designs, which is kind of a unique um, embroidery style that's, that's famous in Lucknow, the city that we've just come from. And with every stitch, they're thinking about this. But it isn't just put this in front of me here, sew this, so that you're thinking about this. We have to explain it to them. We have to explain what this verse means. They keep coming and go, but really explain it again. And it's a continuous witness tool as well. It opens conversations for them. And with every stitch that they put into these things, they're thinking about the verse. They're thinking about Christ as they do this. And we continuously encourage them, pray, see if it's true. He will reveal himself to you. That's how we try to get Christ into everything. This is happening inside a madrasa. We actually have scriptures that, we, that women are working on. So our plan coming up now for the, for the next period is Erin is just about to start high school, so my wife Jenny will be staying back with her and only making short trips to India um, while we get through the high school years. And during that time, I will be going back for longer terms to get things going in a second city and scoping it out. The next city is a little bit more dangerous than the first city, so we really need prayers. The, the Hindu government there has a very militant arm to it, and they're very active in this particular city. So it's not at all an unusual thing for them to come in with a mob in the middle of a service and start attacking everybody and smashing your church. The pastor's lives are threatened all the time. They have their kids beaten in their yards in front of them by these people. So it's the climate we're going into. We're focused on Muslims, which is one advantage for us because the Hindu government is primarily worried about people being evangelized, evangelized away from Hinduism. Um, so we do have that on our side. But again, we know nobody there in the city. It's complete new work. There is nobody working amongst Muslims in this city. Um, in this city, there's almost 400 slums. About a third of the city lives in there. So we're talking about a half a million people roughly are living in slums in this city. And that's not an, at all an unusual thing for India. So what we need for you, if you are not already on our list receiving our updates and praying for us, we have at the back, we have a list we're just asking for an email address and your name, and we will get you monthly updates as well as our prayer guide, which is very, very specific to our ministry. It's been the, the biggest tool that we've had in this battle. Nothing that you've seen here would be happening without people claiming this ground and laying down intense amounts of prayer on this city. We need this both to continue for Lucknow all the way through to the harvest and in a new city where we'll be starting again. So if you're not on our list, please sign up. We, we need every prayer that we can possibly get. And that's why what we attribute the success that, that God has been showing us and what he's been doing and that we've been allowed to go along with. We attribute it to that strength of prayer. We also have at the back, we have a variety of products made by the women in the slums as well as our NGO members. There's uh, fridge magnets, there's earrings, there's some Christmas tree decorations and those sorts of things. Those are by donation only. All, every dollar that comes in through this goes back to the slums and these ministries to benefit them as well. Above all, we need your prayers. And what I really want to leave you with is that encouragement that every person here today, God is asking them to take one more step of faith with them, whatever that is. Before you leave today, I encourage you to pray, God, reveal what are you asking me to do now. No matter what it is, if it's scary or not, 
I encourage you to take that step with them. And what you'll find on the other side of that is going to be something that is going to blow your mind. It's something you're unexpected, and it's going to be a gift of God. Your faith's going to go deeper. The kingdom's going to advance as a result of it. And what it does in you and through you, God will show through that step. Let's pray. Almighty God, I just thank you for what you're doing, Lord, in the world, Lord, amongst these places where it is so brutal, Lord, where faith decisions can cost you your life, Lord. And in the middle of that, Lord, that you're shining light, you're shining light into places that have never seen light before, that you're giving courage, you're giving obedience to those that may need to lay down their lives even today, that your kingdom may be advanced, Lord. Lord, you gave us your son. He laid down our lives for us because you love us. Lord, I pray that you give us that depth of love, Lord, to be willing to lay down our lives for you, for your kingdom, for your glory, Lord, if that's what it takes, Lord. Lord, let not us not count the cost to ourselves, Lord, but the benefit for the kingdom. I pray for these people in India, Lord. Lord, you could rescue from the fire that they're in right now. I pray that you pour your spirit on these communities, that you break every stronghold, every grip that Satan has on these communities to keep them from knowing you, Lord. I pray that you pour your spirit upon them to reveal yourself in dreams and visions through the words of those that strive to reach them, Lord. Lord, I pray that you do an amazing work there, that none be lost, Lord, that it not be a harvest of one or two, but the, every one of these communities come to a faith decision en masse for you, Lord, that you may be glorified through all of this, Lord. For each one here, Lord, I thank you for the stories you've heard today, Lord, of you equipping in brutal times, Lord, in that stressful moment where no one else is responding, Lord, and you use that moment going into it, not even knowing what's going to happen, Lord, but working through the fear to do something great, Lord, and using that as an opportunity to proclaim your name and your power, Lord. I pray for each one here, Lord, that you speak to their hearts to show them the next step, the next step of faith, what you're calling them to, Lord, and that you give them the courage and the obedience to step out on that and on that basis alone, Lord, through faith. I pray these things through Christ our Lord.